I Follow Jesus, a devotional study by Melva Perkis. Book 5, Chapter 2 The Feeding of the Five Thousand The deliberate withdrawal of Jesus from public observation had its effect upon his enemies. Mistaking it for weakness, they pressed home their attacks against him with greater vindictiveness. Their assaults exposed their own wickedness and called forth from Jesus indictments more severe and penetrating than anything they had yet heard. But in the absence of the constant impetus of his miracles, the charges of the scribes and Pharisees bore increasing weight with the curious and selfish elements of the multitudes, and they began to drift away. Even the wider circle of his disciples were repelled when his teaching assumed a more mysterious and deeper tone. All this did not happen suddenly. It gradually becomes apparent as we read the records of the second part of the Galilean ministry, which began with the news of the Baptist's death. Now Jesus is at the height of his popularity, that period when, whithersoever he entered, into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him if they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. And as many as touched it were made whole. Thus it was that when Jesus took his disciples away privately, crossing the lake to the desert beyond Bethsaida Julius. The multitude watched to the course of the boat and, divining its destination, thousands set out on foot round the northern shore, undertaking a journey of some eight or nine miles, so that they might be with him. The purpose of Jesus was thwarted. His great need for quietness and meditation was left unsatisfied. But as he watched the crowds, tired from their long walk, leading their blind, carrying their sick, moving slowly, their faces and their steps turned towards him. He had compassion on them. They were to him like sheep in need of their shepherd. What a characteristic picture of Jesus this is. How comforting for each of us to know that, in spite of our waywardness, if we seek him earnestly, tired from our travelling, weakened by our load, he will turn to us in compassion and minister to us in his abounding love. Putting aside the purpose of his journey, Jesus taught the people and healed their sick. As the day wore on, a problem arose. There were well over five thousand people out here in the desert. They had arrived weary early in the day and were now tired, hungry, and miles from home. Jesus anticipated their need, and leading Philip to one side, he made it the occasion of a test for him. John is careful to tell us that Jesus himself knew what he was going to do. Why was Philip thus singled out? He was a native of Bethsaida, but the true reason seems to have been that he was in particular need of this challenge to his faith. He was the disciple who had said to Nathanael, We have found him whom Moses in the Lord and the prophets did write. Had he learned since those early days that looking upon Christ, he was looking upon the Father? That the power of the God of Moses was manifest in his Son? Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? But the disciples' faith wavered before the magnitude of the problem. He related it to the limitations of the common purse. Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient. It is well to pause before we criticise this failure and perceive the danger in which every disciple stands of making a similar mistake and showing the same lack of confidence in Christ. 
Evening came, and the other disciples saw the problem that Jesus had previously raised with Philip. This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. Their master had a different plan. Give ye them to eat. Though they had just returned from doing marvellous works in his name, these men, like Philip, could not take the suggestion seriously. They too had still to learn. Taking the five barley loaves and two small fishes from the youth who stood near, Jesus told the disciples to make the people sit down on the grass in orderly companies of hundreds and fifties, and offering his father thanks and blessing the bread, he gave the morsels to them to distribute. Five thousand men, beside women and children, were satisfied with food, and twelve baskets of broken pieces were collected. Discussion upon the manner in which the bread was multiplied will yield little profit. All God's creative work is an appeal to faith to the thoughtful man. It is an adventure in faith to believe that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. Those who live and toil in constant touch with the creative power of the Almighty, watching the seasonal transformations of each successive year, the golden miracle of the harvest and the continual wonder of newborn life, have less difficulty in understanding the sign which Jesus gave, and was soon to unfold in its deeper meaning. And will not that deeper meaning reveal a greater miracle still? The broken body of the Son of God was destined to distribute the bread of life among a multitude which no man can number from every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Walking for miles along the muddy, uneven shores of the lake, these people had sought for Jesus. Forgetful of their physical needs, they had listened to his words. How beautifully he fulfilled his promise that, seeking first the kingdom of God, temporal needs will be added. And although the fuller significance of this ministration was to wait for the morrow, can we not see in the twelve baskets remaining a symbol of the love that fulfills the desperate need of man and gains in the giving? The effect of this miracle was immediate and spontaneous. The sheep needing a shepherd became a people wanting a king. They were staggered by the greatness of the power which this man wielded. They accepted with awe his healing qualities directed to the needs of a single sufferer. But this was stupendous power directed to the needs of a hungry nation, power on a national scale. Here surely was the one who should come, the Messiah who should destroy all opposition and bring in the kingdom of God, restoring Israel to her proud place as head of the nations in an age of righteousness and peace. The Passover was at hand. That time when national hopes were high, when the oppression of Rome was most bitterly resented. The murmuring grew in volume until it became an ominous roar. The people surged around their Messiah, intent on marching with him upon Jerusalem and declaring him their king. Jesus looked at his disciples. They were obviously affected by this mass hysteria. Action must begin with them. Matthew records, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, and go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. With the disciples gone, Jesus turned to the people, quietened their clamour, and sent them on their long journey homewards. When the last straggler had disappeared round the bend of the distant shore, Jesus turned upwards into the hills in the gathering darkness, 
to commune with his father. He needed his father's strength and guidance, especially now in these difficult days when the course of his ministry was changing. He must have felt keenly the death of that stalwart wilderness cousin, the increasing pressure of his enemies, the uncertainty of his disciples, the misconceptions of the multitude. When the heart is overwhelmed, its only refuge is in the shadow of the rock that is higher than itself. It must have been so for the Saviour with his greater burdens and his greater strength. If we dare to lift for a moment the veil that conceals this sacred communion, we feel that his prayer was not for himself alone. His thoughts would also be with the men toiling in the darkening waters of the lake. There he stayed on in the lonely heights until, in newfound strength and peace, he was able to return to his loving ministrations below. Meanwhile, the disciples struggled in the darkness against a turbulent sea and a contrary wind. The sails were useless, so they rowed into the gale. The long hours of the night had dragged on, but they made little progress. And this time they were alone. There was no saviour asleep in the stern sheets. Their master had begun that special instruction which the Baptist's death had made urgent and imperative. This was their first great lesson. With characteristic significance, John says, And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. It was necessary for them to learn that not only were they safe with him in the vessel, there was nothing to fear with him on the heights above in prayer with his father. His physical presence was not essential for them to overcome their conflicts. Indeed, the time was approaching when they would be alone in the midst of perils, when the prophet would have become the priest interceding on high, when the blessings for them and for all that followed them would be because they would believe, though they would not see him. In that darkest hour which precedes the dawn, he came walking upon the water. The fitful moon lit up his raiment as he made as though he would pass them. But their cries of fear brought him towards them. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. The single voice of Peter came back to him across the water. Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. This was characteristic of Peter, that impetuous anxiety to show his love and confidence, that spirit which in spite of this imminent lesson is yet to cry, Though all men, Lord, yet not I. Peter had asked for this lesson. Jesus would not quench his earnest spirit by refusing it. Come. Confidently he clambered over the side and walked towards his Lord. But he did not keep the beginning of his confidence firm unto the end. His eyes left his master's face and looked fearfully out into the boisterous night and at the swirling waters below him. In that moment his faith had gone. He began to sink. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? His failure lay not in his decision to come, but in his loss of confidence in his Lord when his adventure of faith had begun. The disciples gladly received him into the boat, and once more a calm descended on the lake, and they were able to get to Capernaum immediately. There is a footnote here which reads, The words, Immediately the ship was at the land, whither they went, John 6, verse 21, are, I think, in contrast with the fact that they had been toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary, Mark 6, verse 48. Thus the meaning would be that they had no further difficulties, 
and proceeded straightway to land. We then continue reading. Many lessons emerge from this night on the sea, nor are they all for the benefit of the immediate disciples alone. Life can present a picture of a dark and turbulent sea with Jesus afar off. It is the slow triumph of faith to see him on the heights above in communion and intercession with his Father. Sometimes he comes to us in the midst of the storm and darkness in unfamiliar form which we must learn to recognize. We are quick to appreciate, if we are slow to learn, that when we walk over the waters to meet him, we must not be dismayed by the darkness, the wind, or the waves. We must believe that his power is greater far, that he can save even unto the uttermost, that faith can only be sustained by keeping our eyes fixed lovingly and obediently upon him. Finally, Few will miss the significance of this miracle for these last troubled years. The sea and the waves are roaring, men's hearts failing, their resources almost spent. But in the last watch of the night, the son will leave his father's presence and come with his word of peace to those who yearn for him. And with him will come the dawn and to the desired haven.